B'Shem Hashem Naseh V'Natzliach, Shir Torah, uh, wonderful to uh, be back in our Tuesday Shiur, Baruch Haba, Baruchim Abayim, Kal Kadosh, we're uh, here in Florida in Aventura, and uh, despite the modesty, the heresy, and the shtuyot that are in this world, we're finding a way to sanctify Hashem's name, Be'ezot Hashem, by learning Torah on a Tuesday night in Florida. Um... For anyone who doesn't understand the ma'ala of learning Torah in the end of days, the, uh, they asked the Arizal, Akadosh, they said, uh, how is it if the Mashiach didn't come in a generation of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, how is he going to come in a generation that's going to be much lower than him, much lower than the, these giants? He says because the ma'asim, the, the actions of the last generation is going to be you know, a small action, is going to be considered a big action. As if uh, someone that goes to a shul with his car, doesn't carry anything on his head, doesn't have to travel three days. All he did is just go in, get inside a uh, four wheels, press the gas pedal, and he arrived 25 minutes later and sat there and listened to Torah for a couple of hours. That's going to be considered as if he traveled three, four, five weeks just to go listen to Shiur Torah for, for a few hours, back in the old days, and even more. So, the Limut uh, Torah that you guys do, Baruch Hashem, that we do together every Tuesday is very, very big, because not only is it necessary for us to do Tshuva, but also it's necessary for the Geulah, for, for the Mashiach to arrive. Now this shiur is going to be for Refua Shlema, for uh, my very dear friend Rav Chaim Ben Aviva. Uh, he's having a uh, major surgery, uh, uh, either tomorrow or the following day, an emergency surgery on his heart, but he, everything goes well. Um, also, Liora Rachel Bat-Chaya, Raizel, Esther Beila uh, Bat-Hadasa, Rachel, uh, David Ben Esriya, Doris Bajora, Levana Bat Sara, um, Dvora Bat Nosedes, uh, Sara Bat Anat, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, and all of Am Yisrael Bezat Hashem will have Refuah Shlema, Refuah Nefesh, and Refuah Taguf. You know, one of the uh, downsides of dealing with the public is that you get a lot of bad news. One of the upsides is that you also get a lot of good news in a sense of, well, not a lot, but you at least get some good news when miracles happen in people's life. You get to see a lot of wonderful miracles that Hashem blesses us with, where you see one person one day, he's, they tell him he's going to die in six weeks, and next day he's alive and uh, walks out of the hospital like nothing ever happened. Unfortunately, it also happens on the opposite. It also happens the opposite. Uh, where one day a person feels healthy, and the next day the doctors tell him, listen, uh, you have to have a surgery, and um, you may not make it. What do you mean? But just yesterday I was perfectly fine. Yesterday I was playing with my kid. Yesterday I was this, yesterday I was that. Yes, Rabotai, yes, Rabotai, yes, yes. Unfortunately, death does not give you a warning sign. When the time has come, person is not going to have much of a warning sign. He's not going to have enough time to settle all of his accounts. Chas Shalom may not even be able to say goodbye to everyone. And this is why the Chachamim say that a person must do tshuva every day. Why? Because you never know. You never know when, when's the last day. None of us think we're ever going to die. We all think, even if you're 119 and 364 days, he still wouldn't think, nah, 120, that was for Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm bigger. If I survive this long, I'm, uh, Hashem has given me at least another year. No one ever thinks. But it's sad, it's very sad that you see people, Mamash, Giborim, one day, strong as a bull, next day, Hashem Yerachem. It's like, almost like they lost 30 pounds in one day. You see pictures, you, if you don't cry, you have, no, you have nothing, you have no heart. You always ask yourself, why do these things happen? Who, what, when, and how? But that's why it's very, very important to know the emet. It's very important to know the truth about the world, why we're in this world. 
Because if you don't know it, life is very miserable. If you think that everything is supposed to be good and there's not going to be hardship, life is going to be miserable. Why? Because the reality is people have a very difficult life with some bits of good in them. It's not the opposite. Even if you have a zillion dollars, it doesn't make a difference. Most of life is difficulties, obstacles, with little bits of pleasure in between the difficulties. Sometimes there's periods of pleasure that are longer than others, but if you think that life is supposed to be comfortable, like we were talking about the other day, life is supposed to be cushy, life is supposed to be all uh, roses, then unfortunately you will end up living a life that's very miserable because you're constantly disappointed that it's not. And the older I get, the older anybody gets, the more you get to know people that uh, unfortunately leave this world too early. Very few, very few have the merit to leave the world at an old age. You know how we always say you... Happy birthday, Adma Veslim, until 120. Realistically, how many people do you know that live past 75, 80? And even if they got to that age, how many of them do you know that actually had their brain? That it was actually worth living those days? It's very few. Most have a very tragic early ending. And I don't mean to depress all of you right in the beginning of the shiur. It's Chazal says you're supposed to actually lighten up the time, you know, the people. Give them a joke in the beginning, but this is Messiah this is what came out. But uh, the important part to think, to, to know, is that the, the, if you know the truth, none of this is depressing. And the reason why is because if you know that this world is just like the sages told us, just like the Torah tells us, this world is a corridor. This world is like a stop sign. This world is like a bus stop. That's it. You're taking a journey from Yerushalayim all the way to Eilat, from Katzeh to Katzeh, from one corner of Israel to the other. Along the way is going to be a bunch of stops if you're on a bus. You're going cross-country. If you're American, you have no idea where Jerusalem is and where Elat is. So let's say America. You're going from New York all the way to California on a bus, on a Greyhound. Somehow they're still in business, Baruch Hashem. But anyway, you're going on this bus. It's going to be a few stops in the middle. Stops for gas. Stops for food. Stops to pick up more passengers. Stop to drop for pa passengers. And the sages explained to us that this whole life, this whole thing we call life, whether it be 20 years or 50 years or 120 years, this whole thing that you have is like one stop, meaning it's a moment. It's not when you go to one of these stops, when a bus stops somewhere, it doesn't stop for days unless it broke down. What does he stop? I stop for a few minutes. Okay, get off. You know, a few people go to the bathroom. A few people get, get, you know, get on, so on and so forth. A few minutes later, guy, toot, come back on the bus. That's it. That's life. So all of the problems that stress us out to the point of us wanting to lose our mind, people wanting to commit suicide, chas v'shalom. People uh, want to, you know, do stupid things. This whole thing. It's like a bus stop. Ten minutes. Five minutes. Some say it's like a dream. Some of the sages explain that this whole life is like a dream, meaning it's even less than the bus stop. Why? Because it doesn't matter how long the dream is. Once you have a dream and you remember your dream, it doesn't matter how long it was. Even if you felt like you were in this dream for a thousand years or a thousand minutes or whatever it is, when you, the second you wake up and you realize the whole thing was a dream, it's like a shock. It's like, wow, that whole thing was a dream? You mean I can't fly? You mean I, I, I'm not married to her? To, oh, I'm married, oh, I'm married to her. Okay, fine. Wait, you mean I don't have the money? Oh, I'm really married? Oh, I can't believe I'm married. Oh, it's not a dream. People get disappointed. Why? It's just a dream. The whole thing is just a dream. 
again, it's just a dream. That's life. When a person comes up to Shemaim at the Beddin of Shemaim, he's going to realize the whole thing was like a dream, just like this. It's gone. This is not supposed to be depressing. This is supposed to be uplifting. Why? Number one, if you know that the whole thing is a dream, you should never have a reason to be depressed. Why? It's not going to last that long anyway. Whatever negativity you're dealing with, whether it be money loss, uh, death, taxes, cancer, whatever it is that's a hardship in the world, it's not going to last that long anyway. Why this life is not that long? Second of all, it should refocus your life, reprioritize your life. It should become much easier to do that. Why? Because you realize, why am I investing so much time for stuff that I'm not going to even enjoy for very long? Why don't I invest more time into things that I'm going to enjoy for longer? Instead of investing so much money and effort into building a house here that I may not even see past the first year or even past the first week of living in it, why don't I invest into the house up there? Because the house up there is eternal, Abutai. The house up there is eternal. These types of thoughts are straight thinking. It's hard sometimes, especially in the beginning, to adjust to it because it's very different than our normal thinking. Most of us are living for today. Most of us are living to enjoy today. Most of us can't wait to get the next car. Most of us can't wait to remodel our kitchen. Most of us can't wait to remodel our house or get a bigger house because that big house that we have right now is no longer big even though we only have two kids and a dog and, and one of the kids just left home, but still we need a bigger house. Most of us are very excited about stuff of this world. We're excited to go to dinner at the new restaurant. We're excited to go to the theater to see some show. We're excited to do a lot of things here. Things that are a waste of time. Things that won't last very long, even in the short life that we have. Most of us are living for this world. But that's also why most of us get depressed very quickly. Because this world constantly disappoints. You're constantly going to get to know people that are not going to be here forever. And that's why at times, like the situation that happened this past Shabbat, when there was a cold blood murder in a conservative temple of 11 born Jews, people are so emotional that they're having a very hard time even thinking about the truth, even listening to the truth, even considering the truth. We're distorting the facts so much that literally anyone that knows any Torah whatsoever that has an ounce of Yirat Shamaim, an ounce of Yirat Shamaim, he reviews this last couple of days and what people have been saying about the so-called temple or conservative shul, whatever you want to call it, and the people that died in it. And you compare what the Torah says about the same thing. He said, oh, oh, there must be two Torahs. It cannot be the same thing. It cannot be the same Torah. Why? Torah says that people that go against the Shem publicly and they are arrogant about it. Toivat Hashem kol gvalev. All of the arrogant, all the gay pride, it's considered disgusting and abomination in Hashem's eyes. But everybody's like, no, they're Kedoshim. What Kedoshim? What Kedoshim? What Kedoshim? What are you talking about? Kedoshim? You know who Kadosh is? You know who the Torah calls Kadosh? Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva died, died, what? Al Kiddush Hashem. And they're saying these people, the homosexuals, that were given a Brit Milat to a Goy on Shabbat and drove to Beknesset on Shabbat are in the same class as Rabbi Akiva. And this, I mean, and this is not, if it's coming from the Reform, who listens to them? 
if it comes from the conservative who listens to them bechlal. Why? Because it's not that to us, it's their own opinions. But the sad part is, Rabotai, is that over the last couple of days, especially the last 24 hours, a number of emails, messages, and all types of phone calls and so on that I've been getting, and Rabbi Ederet has been getting, I'm sure, and Rabbi Zachi, I'm sure, has gotten, and anyone that has any little bit of emet in them, we're not getting them from the reformers and the, and the conservatives. We're getting it from the so-called orthodox. They're saying, oh, you should be ashamed of yourself. You're a chilul Hashem. I'm a chilul Hashem. Why am I chilul Hashem? I work for free for Am Yisrael to get people to do tshuva, come back to Hashem. How come I'm chilul Hashem? What happened? What changed between yesterday and today? Oh, you said that uh, these holy people that died, it's, 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 you said that it's Kiddush Hashem that happened. I said, I didn't say it. Torah says it. Torah says it. Torah says, Mechalev Shabbat Mot Yumat. Did I, did I cre- Can you give me a proof that what I said is wrong? Oh no, but this Rabbi uh, Weinberger, he says that uh, you're wrong. Well, how, did he give you a Torah source? Is there, is, there, is there a Torah source for what he says? Well, he says some rabbi told him that this and this. Okay, I heard what he said. There's no Torah source. There's no Torah source. If there's a Torah source that shows anything I've ever said in my life is wrong, I will be happy to make an entire lecture just about publicizing how wrong I am. No problem. But don't go tell me that these people that go and declare war against Hashem on a day-to-day basis in public in public nonetheless not that they're making sins like the rest of us in private because we're all a little bit of a shine once in a while no they do it in public they're still proud of their actions they go to big knesset with their car with the homosexuality flag on the car and you're going to call them in the same level as Rabbi Akiva? Hashem Yirachem, what level did we fall into? How Hashem is not destroying the world is beyond me. You're calling them in the same level as Rabbi Akiva? Rabbi Akiva? You know what happened to Rabbi Akiva? You know what Rabbi Akiva did? When he was in the Gemara in Masechet Gitin says when he was in prison, and he was in prison, Somebody, one of the, it was Talmidim, would bring him food and water every day. Bring him food and water. Why? Because the Rashaim wouldn't even give him food and water. These Ahurim, these, these Romans, wouldn't give him food and water. It said that some, you could arrange for yourself food and water. So one of his Talmidim would bring him food and water. One day, no food. And just a little bit of water. I'm sorry, food, but just a little bit of water. So Rabbi Akiva says, okay, so I'm just going to drink. I'm not going to eat. Rabbi Akiva, you need to eat. No, I can't. Why? It's not enough water for me to do netilat yadayim. It's not an, the water that you gave me. It's not enough water to do netilat yadayim so I can eat the food you gave me. So I can't eat the food without netilat yadayim. It's not enough to... It's not Moshe uh, Rabbeinu told us in Mount Sinai. Rabbi said, you should uh, wash your hands. Three on this hand, three on this hand. That's what his Talmud told him. It's, I'm sorry to, to remind you, but the Netilat Yadayim is Rabbanan. It's, it's, it's a rabbinical mitzvah. It's not the right. It's not like... Uh, and anyway, you're in jail. You're, you're anus. Rabbi Akiva looks at him. He says, Chas v'shalom that I would ever go against even a single law for my dear friends and colleagues. Meaning, what do you mean, Rabbanan, Deoraita, what are you talking about? It's all the same. It's all Hashem. He wasn't willing to eat in prison because he didn't have enough water to wash his hands. And you're going to put him that got his skin peeled off with a fork-like tool by the Yisraelim Arurim, and in the middle of doing it, he's saying, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And the Gemara Masechet Brachot says, Ashrecha Rabbi Akiva, that your neshama left your body at Echad. 
They're peeling your skin. They're peeling his skin. Instead of saying, ow, instead of saying, stop it, instead of saying, I shan't want to say, I scream. I want to scream. I didn't have it. What is he saying? He's saying, Shmai Slav. It's Talmidim is saying, for the Rav, you could just say one word, kill everybody. You, are, you have the holy name. He goes, Chas v'shalom, I killed them. My whole life I've been waiting to, f- <coughs> to fulfill the mitzvah. To fulfill the mitzvah of what? To love Hashem with all my soul. All my money, I did. All my heart, I learned Torah every, every minute. As soon as I discovered Torah, I learned 80 years. But to learn it with all my soul, I was scared my whole life. How am I going to fulfill this mitzvah? Now I have the opportunity to fulfill the mitzvah of, of, of loving Hashem with my soul itself. And you want me to ruin it? You want me to consider the fact that I'm dealing with agonizing pain that they're peeling my skin off? Who has time to consider such things? And you're going to put him that died on Shema Israel, from Israel, in the same class as a homosexual? Toivat Hashem? Go on Nefesh? Busha v'cherpa to all these rabbis that are supporting this. Busha v'cherpa. Busha v'cherpa. You're putting him in the same class? This is Chilul Hashem. If what they did in, 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 in Pittsburgh is not enough Chilul Hashem, what the Orthodox, so-called Orthodox, that are defending them, that's Chilul Hashem. That's a much bigger Chilul Hashem. You're putting them in Kedoshim to you, Alik. Rabotai, there's only one emit. If you don't like it, look for a different religion. Look for a different religion. At least be kind enough not to call it Torah. At least be kind enough to say, you know what? It's not for me, this Judaism. Why? It requires truth, and I'm a liar. So I can't handle truth all the time. I want to be a liar, like most of humankind. So it's not for me, this Judaism. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to become a Sadducee. Don't call it Judaism. Call it something else. And if you don't have, you say, no, no, I like Judaism. I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. I like it. Okay. But uh, what you're saying is tough. Okay. It's tough. Is it true though? Does it have a lachic background? Does it have a lachic support? Yes. You don't like it. It hurts your heart a little bit. Your cousin died. Your uncle died. Your uncle could have died. Whatever, all the things that it affects you, you're biased a little bit. Be quiet. It's tough for you? No problem. Be quiet. Don't say yes. Don't say no. Don't say I support. Don't say I go against. Be quiet. Is it so hard to be quiet? Rabotai, all of those people that are saying anyone that died because they're a Jew is considered someone that died on Kiddush Hashem simply did not learn the actual halacha. He read it on Google. He read it on Google, maybe on uh, yeshiva, yeshiva.com. He saw an article and somebody said, oh look, somebody died on Kiddush Hashem and he uses that as halacha. But if you look at the Rambam, the Rambam very clearly says that in order for someone to die on Kiddush Hashem, it's not that they have to die because they're a Jew. Plenty of Jews die every day. What every person that ever died, every Jew that ever died in a war died in Kiddush Hashem? They're all in the same class as Rabbi Akiva and his friends? So why is Rabbi Akiva mentioning Gemara and they're not? Why don't we start a new Gemara? 2,000 years of Mesirut Nefesh. Everyone died in Kiddush Hashem. Look at the Alakha. What does the Alakha say? He has to die for the Torah and Mitzvot. Meaning he didn't die because he's a Jew only. He died because he protected the Torah and Mitzvot. Because the Jew is born a Jew. He didn't pick and choose to be a Jew for the most part unless he converted. And that's a minority anyway. 
And that same Jew could have been a Mechalel Shabbat yesterday. Could have been a homosexual today. Could have been an idol worshiper today. She told me because somebody shot him in the face. Because he was posing in, uh, naked on the internet and someone doesn't like people who pose naked on the internet. He's like, oh, I'm going to kill him because I don't like Jews. So that guy died in Kiddush Hashem? He's in the same class as Rabbi Akiva? What's the matter with people today? Have you lost your minds? Have you lost any sense of honesty whatsoever? Is money that important to people that you simply cannot de- determine the truth from the Sheker? There's, there's no difference be anymore. It's Busha. As I said on Sunday, we're not celebrating anybody's death. You're not even supposed to celebrate the death of a goyim. You're not even supposed to celebrate the death of the reshaim. No one is celebrating any death. No one wants anyone to die. No one wants anyone to even get hurt. But there is emit. The emit doesn't change. You cannot change the status of a Jew just because he died. You cannot change the status of a person just because maybe it makes you feel better. Oh yeah, he died in Kiddush Hashem, this, uh, this, this idol worshiper, so uh, he's going to Gan Eden. You decide he's going to Gan Eden? Hashem has to check with you he's going to go to Gan Eden? He lived his whole life against Hashem. His whole life he was vocal about him going against Hashem, but because you're saying he died in Kiddush Hashem, you're deciding. You're the Bedin of Lamata. You're deciding he's going to the same Gan Eden as Rabbi Akiva. Unfortunately, Rabotai, even the people that know the truth have a very, very hard time grasping everything we just said. And the reason why is because emotions are flying wild. Emotions are all over the place. No one likes to see anyone even semi-related to them, a distant relative, even someone that they went to high school with, die. I already know a bunch of people from my high school class, graduating class that died. Every time I think about it, it makes me sad. No one wants anyone to die. But you cannot change the truth because of that. The truth is, Rabotai, if you live according to the Torah, death is not such a bad thing. Death is not such a bad thing. Why? All you're doing is going from this stop to a much better one, to your destination. If you lived according to the Torah, you've completed your job, and Hashem is now going to give you a handsome, eternal reward. Death is not necessarily such a bad thing. It may be a horrible thing for the people left behind because they're going to miss you. That's obvious. It may be a horrible thing for the difficulty that's left behind now that you're missing from the world but for you yourself it's not such a bad thing if you live according to the Torah if you didn't then death is a horrible thing because now your troubles are just beginning now that's not Yaron Ruven deciding this that is the 13 principles of faith which if you do not believe or agree with you, by definition, are considered a heretic that cannot be counted as a Jew. The 13 principles of faith say that there is schar ve'onish. There's reward and there's punishment. If you do not believe in reward and punishment, you have a very serious problem. So for all of those so-called orthodox people that do not like to think of Hashem as a punishing being, as a punishing entity, surprise, surprise, you, my friend, are less Jewish than you think. Because in order to be Jewish, you must believe that there is reward and punishment. You must. So if you're saying Hashem doesn't punish people in this world because they're homosexuals, Hashem doesn't punish people because they're heretics, Hashem doesn't punish people because they're intermarried, He doesn't punish them, so when does he punish them? Because no one wants to believe in Gainom either. 
Because the rabbi said that Geinom is only uh, embarrassment. So that means that the guy that's an idol worshiper, a homosexual, a uh, whatever other type of sinner, he could do whatever he wants. Mechalel Shabbat, he could do whatever he wants his whole life. And the other guy is learning Torah from morning to night. And oh, they go up, they both go up to Shemaim. Say, oh, okay, you, you kept Torah? Okay, Gan Eden. You, what'd you do? Oh, you didn't keep Torah? You didn't keep Shabbat? Oh, you were homosexual. Okay. Oh, you went with dogs too. Okay. Oh, you, you were an idol worshiper also. Okay. Uh, you killed some people. Wow, Hitler and you. Okay. You know what? We're going to put you where Hitler used to be. We're going to put you in the same department Hitler used to be. But since it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, Geinom doesn't really exist, we're just going to make fun of you for like an hour. We're going to make fun of you to embarrass you a little bit. So you cry, and then you go to Gan Eden, right next to the guy. They just came. Did you see the guy just passed? He went to, to Gan Eden. You're going to go with him. Just, just get to know him now. Say, I'll see you in a few minutes. Because, come, come. We're going to embarrass you a little bit. But don't, get the, don't take it personally so much. Don't cry so much. Just get, you know, we got some, a few jokes. What do people think? This is what people think. Even as a secular person, with any any mind whatsoever, you cannot think such a stupid thing. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to stick to the emet because the emet obligates us. It obligates us to change. And if you're not willing to change, that's one thing. But to stop other people from changing, to make fun of people that are influencing others to change, that just means you're an evil person. It doesn't mean that you're anything good at all. It means you're evil. Why? Because you want everyone to stay losers just like you. You don't want to change. You don't want to progress. You don't want to succeed. That's your business. That's your business. But you stopping others from progressing, you stopping others from going to Gan Eden, you stop others from moving forward and becoming better, you're evil. And this is what every single person that likes to make comments on the internet, going against the Torah, that doesn't agree with their sad reality, they need to think about this. What's the point? What is the point of this comment? Oh, so I'm trying to influence other people to not follow the Torah? Why? What does it bother you that other people are getting more religious? What does it bother you that other people believe in Gan Eden and Geinom? Why does it bother you? It only bothers people because it reminds them that if everybody else does tshuva, they're going to be the only loser left behind. And no one wants to be the last one. They always, misery likes company. That's where the Gemara says, Geinom continues to grow. A lot of losers there. But how do we get to a point of at least knowing we are in the right start? This Mishnah in Avot, chapter 6, first Mishnah, we're in, I believe, the fourth lecture about it already told us an enormous amount of information about the value of Torah, Lishma, the value of studying Torah for its own sake. And we'll continue to see how this connects to our day-to-day world that we live in right now. Rabbi Meir Omer, Kol HaOsek Batorah Lishma Zochel Edvarim Arbe Velo Od Ela Shekol HaOlam Kulo Kedai Hulo נקרא רע, אהוב, אוהב את המקום, אוהב את הבריות, משמח את המקום, משמח את הבריות. ומלבשתו ענווה ויראה, ומכשרתו להיות צדיק, חסיד ישר ונאמן, ומרחתו מן החטא, ומקרבתו לידי זכות. ונהנין ממנו עצה ותושייה, בינה וגבורה, שנאמר, לי עצה ותושייה, אני בינה, לי גבורה, ונותנת לו מלכות וממשלה. He continues, but I'm hoping that Be'ezrat Hashem will complete everything I just said today, and continue the rest. Most of what I said, we already did. And we'll continue from that point forward. But this Mishnah says the following, I'll repeat it for anyone who wasn't part of the lecture or just doesn't remember it, which will make you normal. 
Rabbi Meir says, whoever engages in Torah study for its own sake merits many things. Furthermore, the creation of the entire world is worthwhile for his, for his sake alone. Meaning you learn Torah for the sake of serving Hashem. Simply said, tamim tiye, simple. You learn Torah, why? Hashem said so. Are you going to make money out of it? No. Maybe one day, maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. All I know is I'm only learning because Hashem said so. Are you going to write any books? No. Not sure. Maybe. Who knows? But I'm not learning for the book. What are you learning for? I'm learning because Hashem said so. I'm learning because the Torah is going to make me a better human being. I'm learning because the Torah is going to make me a better Eved Hashem. A servant of Hashem. The Mishnah starts off by saying, not only does he get reward, but literally the entire world was created just for him or her. Like even if the whole world was full of Reshaim, Kofrim, heretics, and he's there, she's there, learning Torah for the sake of learning Torah, the whole world is still worth it. Why? You. You exist. You learn Torah. You come to Yeshua at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday. For what? No one's obligating you. No one's putting a gun to your head. No one's going to pay you. You're learning Torah for the sake of learning Torah. You're learning Torah that hopefully you're going to change. Hopefully you're going to improve. The whole world is worthwhile for your sake. Furthermore, he's called a friend, a beloved. A friend of who? A friend of Hashem's. A beloved of Hashem. Hashem says in Kalara Bati, because he loves me, I love him. He tells about a person that learns Torah Lishma. He shows me he loves me because he's learning Torah for its own sake, and because of that, I love him. Yeah, but it says that Hashem loves everyone, no? Not necessarily. Actually, it says that Hashem hates some people too. And it says he loves some people more than others. He doesn't love everybody equally. Whoever told you that is fooling you or is mistaken. doesn't say that. There's no source to that. There's several people that Hashem specifically says, I hate them. It Yaakov Avti Vet Esav Saneti. Yaakov, I loved him, but Esav, I hate him. That's written, Prophet Malachi. It's Pasuk in the Torah. Toivat Hashem kol gvalev. Anyone that's arrogant, Hashem hates him. He considers him disgusting. Just like you walk into a public bathroom and you think it's disgusting, that's what Hashem thinks of somebody that's arrogant. Disgusting. So here we see already just a couple quick ones. Hashem also hates old men that go with young women. Gemara says, and there's several others that Hashem hates, but there's also several others that Hashem loves more than others. Why would He love one person more than the other? For obvious reasons, just like a father is always going to naturally love one of his sons more than the others if that son serves him better, if that son respects him more. If, the, if, if he has two sons, and he asks for coffee, and one son says, Abba, get coffee for yourself. It's over there in the closet. You should get it. Make me one too. While the other one runs to the kitchen as soon as Abba finishes the sentence, already putting sugar, putting mine, putting this, putting that. He's excited to serve Abba. You're telling me that after repeated repeatedly doing this mitzvah of honoring Abba, he's not going to love the other the son more. Obviously, it's natural, it's normal. He loves the omnipresent, meaning this person that's learning to offer its own sake, that is the epitome of showing Hashem love. You giving tzedakah is a nice thing, does not necessarily show love. Sometimes tzedakah is given as an act of ego. Sometimes tzedakah is given as an act of arrogance. It's not necessarily always a good thing. You go into Beknesset, 
could be a good thing, should be a good thing, but it's not always a good thing. Sometimes people go to Beknesset to socialize. Such people, it's better off they don't go. It's a sin for them to go. Sometimes you see women show up to Beknesset at 5.30 in the morning for nets. And I always wonder, what, all of these women don't have kids? Or husbands? How come the husband's not here at 5.30 in the morning? How come the kids are not here at 5.30 in the morning? What is she doing here at 5.30 in the morning when she's not obligated? It always find, I always find that strange. Not that they shouldn't go to Beknesset, but you should worry about the others going. The husband specifically, the older kids specifically, the ones that are obligated to go. Or better yet, you see them running in the streets, running in the streets to get to Beknesset on time. It's better off you never go to Beknesset one time in your life than run in the streets. Especially as a woman. It's immodest. One guy looks at you the way you run, it was better off you didn't come to the world. Not just didn't go to Beknesset. It was better off you didn't come to the world than go up to the Beddin of Shemaim with such a sin. Running in the streets so guys look at you. No, but I'm going to Beknesset. Who told you to go to Beknesset running? Who told you to go to Beknesset running? Who told you to run the streets? Who told you to run the streets? Where's the vein in al The woman run the streets. Who says that? Oh no, but I'm modest. Modest out. What woman is modest running? I see so-called religious women running in the streets. They're doing exercise. Who told you this is allowed? Who told you it's allowed to run in the streets as a woman? Your body moves in an inappropriate way for men. You get attention. This is not the attention that a body says is looking for. You don't like what I said? Find the proof against it. Not your local rabbi. The book. The book. Find me a book with a respectable, honorable Yeresh Shamayim Posek that says otherwise. Find it. Not your local rabbi that says yes to whatever you say because he's afraid of his next paycheck. You want to show the Creator love? You start fulfilling Torah even if you don't agree with it. You start fulfilling Torah for the sake of Torah. He gladdens the omnipresent, meaning a person that fulfills Torah even if it, is, if it disagrees with his logic. It disagrees with his reality. It disagrees with his desires sometimes. But he does it. This is what makes Hashem happy. Why? Because he is now a gibo. As a gibo, who is a hero? Who's a hero in the Torah? What, somebody that can lift a building? Somebody that could, uh, what, that, that, that won a contest? Who's a gibor? Gibor is someone that beats his yetzerah, beats his desires. He gladdens his creatures too. Meaning, you can't just say, oh, I love Hashem, but every single person that I meet, I break their heart. Every single person that I meet, I make them sad. It's not possible to love Hashem and make every single person sad. You have to do what you're doing for the sake of Hashem, but that also means that you're going to love His creation too. But then you're going to tell me, wait a minute, so, so, so that means if I love people, I'm not going to rebuke them. If I love people, I'm not going to tell them the truth because uh, it offends people. Opposite. If you love somebody, you have to tell them the truth. The only difference is that you have to be careful in how you tell them. If you love your child and you see that he's about to put his finger into an electric socket and you don't tell him something because you don't want him to get scared from your voice, you don't love your son. You love yourself. But if you tell him, then that shows an indication that you do love him. Why? Because you want to protect him. When you see a Jew that's violating Shabbat or any one of the mitzvot in the Torah and you tell him this is a violation, not because I'm judging you, not because I'm better than you, not because of any other reason other than the fact that Hashem said don't do it and you're doing it. Or Hashem said do it and you're not doing it. Hashem said wear tzitzit. You're not wearing tzitzit. The Gemara Maseret Menachot says at the end of days, if you don't wear a tzitzit, you're going to be the first one that's going to get slaughtered. Why? 
you have so much confidence and arrogance that you have so many extra mitzvot that you're not even fulfilling the easy one, like wearing tzitzit. So if you love the person, you can tell him this. Why? He says, he's not wearing tzitzit, me skin. He's not wearing tzitzit, he's not making a million mitzvot a second. He's not doing it. Why? Because he's so confident at all of his other mitzvot. He's like, no, no, Mashiach comes, I'm going to be okay. You're going to tell him this. Because you love him. You're going to tell her she has to start putting some clothes on because you love her. Why? Because if she doesn't, no Mashiach in the world can help her. So gladden the omnipresent, gladdens the creatures, doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to say things that agree with them. It means that you're always going to do things that are going to fulfill Hashem's will, even if it sometimes disagrees with them. But it's for their sake and their sake alone. The Torah clothes him in humility and fear of God and makes him fit to be righteous, devout, fair, and faithful. This is where we got to. Since this Torah that you're learning for the sake of Torah is so pure, it'll naturally make this person more humble over time, softer, easier to deal with, not so arrogant about all of their mitzvot that they did in 1946 and 1948 and yesterday and the day before. Only the Shaim count what they did. Tzadikim worry about what they're going to do. The Torah clothes him with humility and fear of Hashem. It makes him fit to be righteous. This type of Torah will make a person over time much more of a tzaddik, much more of a tzaddikah. Why? You're fulfilling it with purity. No bias, no disease, no virus. It's pure. Please stop playing with the phone. If you can't stop playing with the phone, then leave. It's distracting to me and it's distracting to everybody else. Anyone that has their phones on, put it on vibrate or throw it in the garbage. Either one doesn't make a difference to me. This Torah is much more serious than your text messages, much more serious than anything else. You practice it the wrong way, you can turn a Kiddush Hashem into a Chilul Hashem. Gemara says Chilul Hashem is one of the mitz- one of the Averot. You- Cannot repent for in this life. Repenting for Chilul Hashem only begins with death. Sitting in a shield Torah playing with your phone is Chilul Hashem. Telling people that are homosexuals and idol worshippers and Mechale Shabbat that they're dying on Kiddush Hashem is Chilul Hashem. That's the emit. That's the emit. There's no other in it. It's not convenient. All of us know uh, one, two, three, four, five thousand homosexuals, chilonim, echalel shabbat, and all of them in between. All of us know them. Doesn't change anything. Doesn't change anything that you know them, that I know them, that everybody knows them. Doesn't change anything. The fact that someone is a sinner does not change anything because he's related to you. And the only thing that's going to protect us, the only thing that's going to protect us 
from being infected with their sin is learning Torah and fulfilling Torah Lishma. Because this Mishnah com- continues, it says, and it moves him away from sin and draws him near to merit. What does it mean? It moves him away from sin. Obviously, if you're learning Torah Lishma, you don't want to make any sins. Obviously, if you're learning Torah Lishma, you know, you want to make more mitzvot. But there's something more. In today's politically correct world, the reason why you're seeing an enormous amount of rabbis and public speakers and politicians and whoever wants to get themselves five minutes of fame on YouTube to advocate for these sinners, why are you getting so much of that? Because unfortunately, people cannot get over the bias. People are not scared of God. They're scared of money. And if you say what they say, if you tell people, listen, all of these people are kedoshim. They're holy. So what happens then? Everybody says, look at this tzaddik rabbi. He sees the good in the bad. He's like uh, Rabbi Yitzhak bin Birdicho. He's a Baal Shem Tov, Gilgul. Gilgul, Baal, he's, he's Aaron Akoen, Rodev Shalom. Look, he says, look, he says, the guy that was an enemy of Hashem his whole life, he's a tzaddik, like Rabbi Akiva. Look at such a good rabbi. Such a nice rabbi. You know what? Where do I make the check payable to, sir? Oh, rabbi, rabbi. Where do I make the check payable to? We're going to build a new center. For why? Because you're such a tzaddik. This is what happens. People that want donations lie all day to their teeth. Now, they don't necessarily all start that way. Initially, because people don't have much experience, don't have much Yirat Shamayim, or perhaps don't have much Emunah, whichever one or all of them, they're scared of money. They're scared of people with money. They see a guy, you know, he's like... He's about to write a ten thousand dollar check, but you saw that he drove on Shabbat to your Bet Knesset. But you know he's telling you, yeah, yeah. Where should I make the check payable to? I'm going to give you ten thousand. So now this new, brand new little baby rabbi, he's thinking, wait, if I tell him that you know how to drive on Shabbat, he's probably not going to give me the ten thousand. So let me let me just accept it, not say anything, and over time I'll be a mekarev. Over time I'll do kiruv with him. Over time, because now he's going to donate, so that means he's going to come to this Beknesset on his car, but eventually I'm going to convince him not to. So you close your eye one time. And there's another guy, his friend's coming. This guy is 15,000. Oh, 15,000. Oh, you, you, you drove a motorcycle to the synagogue on Shabbat. Okay, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's okay, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll make a rev, I'll go a whole group. I'll do Kiruv of the Khalil Shabbat and the Homo and the Say This, and I'll, I'll do it. I'll bring, bring, bring. And little by little, you start turning an Orthodox Shul into a reform. Why? Because you're going to do Kiruv in 27,000 years from now. But little by little, what ends up happening when you close your eye once, you end up closing your eye twice. You close your eye twice, it ends up being three times. And then four, and then five, and then six, and then ten, and then a hundred, and a thousand. And eventually it's 10 years of closing your eye. It's 15 years of closing both of your eyes. And eventually, you've closed your eyes so much, you forgot what the truth is. You forgot what the emet was, that you believed originally when you took the role before you got the first non-kosher check. So now, your dot is not dot Torah. Your dot is their dot. The guy that wrote you the check, he influenced you. He did kiruv on you instead of you doing kiruv on him. And over time, because you did not move away from sin, because your Torah was not pure, the Torah is not going to protect you. And little by little you see these rabbis and you see these different people that used to be Tamidech Chachamim, they used to be something special, and you see how their opinions become synonymous with the tzibu, 
Never in history has such a thing happened. Never in history did the rabbi have the same opinion as the tzibu. Never. Why? If he's like them, what do we have to learn from him? If you're just like me, what are you going to learn from me? If we're going to go out for drinks after the shiul, why would you listen to me? A rabbi is not supposed to be your friend. A rabbi is not supposed to tell you everything you want to hear. He's supposed to tell you what God wants you to hear. But when you're not careful, what ends up happening is that you end up losing Da Torah. You end up losing Da Torah. Now, what is really the role of a rabbi? The Mishnah continues and says, This person that's fulfilling the Torah, learning the Torah for Shema, for the sake of Hashem, from him people enjoy counsel and wisdom, understanding and strength. As it is said in Proverbs 8.14, Mine are counsel and wisdom, I am understanding, mine is strength. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 14, the speaker is the Torah. And the Torah says, Mine are counsel, wisdom. I am understanding, mine is strength. Meaning that the Torah is telling us that not only does it provide wisdom and counsel to help people that learn it and fulfill it, but also it provides understanding and spiritual strength to prevail over adversity. But this very same pasuk that's being used as a source, the Chachamim are putting it in the Mishnah to elaborate, to give us further detail of what it actually means to have counsel, wisdom, understanding, and strength. It's actually trying to tell us what is the role of a rabbi, what is the role of a teacher, what is the role of a person that learns Torah Lishma, what is the role of a parent that's going to use the Torah that he's learned, or that she's learned. First and foremost, it's telling you your goal with this Torah is not to be people's friend. Why? Because as soon as you become friends, your opinion is now bias. Your opinion now is distorted by feelings. You're not going to want to tell them certain things because you feel bad because you know this one and you know that one and this and that, and the reality is that sometimes people just need the black and white. And if you don't tell them the black and white, they're never going to change. More than a few times people text me, and in today's world, it's not like when text messaging first came out 20 years ago or so. Today when somebody texts you, automatically they send you their picture, because their profile has their picture. And many times women put the most horrifying pictures in the world in regards to immodesty they put their profile picture which is very immodest and not necessarily because of clothes obviously that's a reason sometimes they are forgot to put clothes on but I'm not just talking about that sometimes you simply see a woman with a headshot just a headshot just her face but her face is looking like she just came out of a nudie magazine she has a face, facial features specifically to try to attract the attention of men. Immodesty is not just clothes, Rabotai. It's not just speaking. It's behavior. So they ask me some very serious question, something that I said in some shiul, something that they heard from somebody else, and instead of getting an answer, for their very, very important question, nine out of ten times, the first answer they get is something they didn't ask for. Please remove your picture and change it with something that's modest because I cannot look at your text. Oh, you're being judgmental. Oh, it's not nice. Oh, I wasn't always religious. Believe it or not, 99% of them don't say any of that. 99% of this, oh, thank you, Kabbalah. You're right. 
You're right. Thank you. You know what? You're right. Yeah, I'm, uh, I shouldn't. Yeah, you're right. I'm going to change my picture. They change the picture on the spot. On the spot, they change it. I thought the first time I did it, oh, wow, I'm going to have World War 17. Woman tells me, thank you. I do it again. Woman says, thank you. I do it again. She goes, thank you. My husband, he asked me to put this picture. I'm saying you should tell your husband to call me. Tell your husband to call me. I'll teach him that he's not supposed to publicize his goods to the world. It's private goods. The women, you tell them the truth, Rabotai, they say thank you. Why? Because they know it's true the whole time. They were just waiting for somebody to tell them. Very rarely does somebody say something that's negative. Very rarely. The role of the rabbi is not to tell you all the things you want to hear. The role of the rabbi is to tell you the things that you're supposed to hear. The things that are going to help you. That's how you get to enjoy people. And them enjoy you as a rabbi, as a leader. And the Mishnah says, people will enjoy his counsel. People will enjoy his wisdom. People will enjoy the understanding and the strength. When it comes to counsel... The Midrash Shmuel says that a genuine Torah scholar is going to be able to give you counsel on anything. Not just halacha, not just what happened in this parasha, but he's going to be able to give you counsel about your day-to-day life. Hey, Rabbi, listen, my partner... I just found out he's stealing from me. What do I do? If I approach him, he'll probably run away and I'll never get the money. If I sue him, he'll probably hide. He's hiding the money. If I this, if I that, what do I do? How do I address this this issue? Oh, Rabbi, listen. My wife, I don't know. She's not really paying attention to me lately. I don't know why. If I say something, it's going to start a fight. If I don't say something, I'm going to want a divorce. What do I do? What do I do? Oh, Rabbi, listen, I don't know what to do. Wow, what happened? I just found out my my kid is looking at uh, same sex. What do I do? If I tell him something, it may break him. If I don't tell him something, he's going to break himself. What do I do? Rabbi is not only going to tell you things about Allah. He's not only going to tell you things about what it says in the parasha. He's going to tell you things that are etzot, different counsel by using the Torah's wisdom. That's what tushia means. Tushia means wisdom, but Torah wisdom. Maray Masechet Sanhedrin, page 26b says, tushia is Torah wisdom, meaning that the Talmud Chacham is going to be able to connect whatever mundane issue you have with something that happened in the Torah. Personally, this was one of the most impressive things right off the bat that changed my life when I was introduced to this first. I would ask Rabbi Ephraim a question about my life. Obviously, I didn't have any Torah knowledge to ask him about Torah. So I would ask him something about my life. My employees are this. My uh, customer is this. The government is this. All that types of troubles that I was going through. And you would always connect whatever I said to something that happened in the Torah. Some halacha some story, some rabbi, some question, so constantly. And you literally see how the Zohar Kadosh says that the Torah is the blueprint of creation. The Zohar Kadosh, Parashat Truma, says that the Torah is the blueprint of creation. This is one of the ways you see how the Torah literally is the blueprint. All of your issues, whether holy or mundane, are in the Torah. Nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Everything you want to deal with, everything you're dealing with, everything you've dealt with, and everything you will ever deal with is inside the Torah today. Waiting for you to look for it. Waiting for you to experience it and want to know the truth about it. The Talmud Chacham is going to be able to show you where it is, show you how it is, and sometimes it's going to shock you. Because sometimes 
it's going to shake your reality in a way that forces you to either change or to admit you're a loser. One way or the other, you have to do something. Either you're going to admit, I don't suffer enough from this problem for me to change myself, so therefore I'll just continue to lose on this problem. Or, you know what? I know it's hard to change, but suffering longer is even harder. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. Bina Rabotai is understanding. The person that's learning Lishma is going to bring joy to people by giving them understanding. What is this understanding? The Midrash Moral explains that this understanding is actually showing how whatever issue you have, he breaks it down into a practical way and show you how it's relevant to your life. Whatever issue there is, whether it be, let's say, a weekly parasha, he'll show you how it's relevant to your life. It's something in the uh, Zohar, I'll show you how it's relevant to your problem. It's something in the Shulchan Aruch, I'll show you how it's relevant to your business situation. The Talmud Chacham is going to take the complex, something that's miraculous, mystical, far away, hard to understand, and break it down into a simple, understandable, relevant, little bit of information for you to chew on. And understand, it's not such a big deal. It's not the end of the world. And then, Rabotai, the Talmud Chacham is supposed to give you strength. He's supposed to give you chizuk. What is this chizuk? Chizuk, if we were all naturally all strong, and we didn't have a yetzara, none of us would need chizuk. None of us would need to be strengthened. Why? I'm already strong. But Torah says that we need it. Chizuk is something that you need. The Gemara says you need chizuk every day. Every day you need chizuk. Why? Because every day the Yetzara gets chizuk. Every day the Yetzara is stronger and stronger trying to beat you. Stronger and stronger trying to break you. Either because you haven't progressed in a long time, so now he wants to, Show you, hey, listen, look, you're a loser. Why? You've been the same loser for 20 years. You didn't get a change today? Like, you know what, 20 years plus one day. Ah, yeah, let me, let me stay a loser for another day. And the Yetzirah got stronger out of doing nothing. Why? By just reminding you of your past. Reminding you that you haven't changed in so long, might as well not change. Or the Yetzirah is even more clever. You take the first step. You take the first step. Yetzirah starts to all of a sudden remind you of all the things. Like, listen, this is hard what you're doing. Are you crazy? You're taking too much of yourself, man. I love you. Don't do so much. You're going to put Kisui Roshan? They're going to call you Taliban. You're going to put Kisui Roshan? Where are you, Ben Ishchai? Where, where are you, what are you, what are you, what are you Baba Sali? Where are you going to put Kisui Roshan? What's the matter with you? People are going to look at you strange. Everybody's wearing a wig. You're going to put Kisui Roshan? Oh, what? Are you crazy? Oh, yeah. What? You're going to put Tzitzit? It's hot. It's so hot wearing a Tzitzit. You, I'm hot. The Yitzhak tells you, I'm hot already just looking at you. I'm hot looking at you wearing Tzitzit. It's a summer. It's Florida. It's 900 degrees outside. You're wearing tzitzit. Are you crazy? Are you on a kippa? People go, you're a Jew. You know how much anti-Semitism is in the world? You know how much anti-Semitism is in the world? You're going to wear a kippa? You're going to publicize you're a Jew? A lot of people just died last week. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? <laughs> That's what it's not tells you. In your head. Constantly. Constantly. What did you do? You just took one step. And already the Yetzirah gave you a thousand excuses of why you shouldn't. Either because you haven't in the past or because it's so hard in the present. And the worst of it all is the Yetzirah, all of a sudden, he is a professional in showing you all of the Rishayim in the world that used to be Tzadikim. You start doing tshuva, you start doing good things, and all of a sudden you get a little email. Hey, you see Rabbi so-and-so from high school? Look, he's now a woman. Oh, you see Rabbi so-and-so? Yeah, he stole money from the school. You really see this woman, she cheated on the house. They show you all the reshaim, all of a sudden they show up at your doorstep. And they, what does Yetzirah say? Look, they all did more than you. 
They all did more than you. They wore the kippah, the tzitzit, the kisui rosh, the this, the that. This. And anyway, they failed. Anyway, they're going to go, look what they happened. They're all going to gain them. So, what, you think it'd be better than them? You think it'd be better than them? That's the atomic bomb. That is the atomic bomb of every weak person that allows himself to listen to the Yitzhara for even a second. Why? He's right. Yitzhara is right. They were all better than you at some point before they failed. But they're not better than you now. They chose their situation. It didn't just happen to them. And it didn't just happen one time and, and overnight. It was wickedness over an extended period of time. The reality is, Abutai, is that the Yitzhara is constantly getting stronger and stronger. And the person that's learning and fulfilling Torah Lishma, his obligation is to give you chizuk, to give you the strength to overcome your Yitzhara. But there lies the big question. In fact, two big questions. You have someone that Hashem sent you, whether in person, via mail, email, text message, telepathy, smoke signals, who knows, Ruach HaKodesh, someone in the world you're connected to that is learning and fulfilling Torah Lashma. Even if it's someone that died a thousand years ago and you have his book and you live by it because it's the Rambam, whatever it is, the point is you have it, right? The question, there's two questions you have to ask yourself now. And this counsel that you asked for, that Hashem sends you hand-delivered to your house. This counsel. First question. Did you get the counsel? You have a rabbi. You go to a shul every day. You think he's the greatest in the world. Is he giving you any counsel or is he just telling you everything you want to hear? A lot of people tell me, yeah, my rabbi is such and such. My rabbi said this. My rabbi did this. My rabbi said that. Okay, did your rabbi ever say something against what you uh, believe? Did your rabbi ever rebuke you? Did your rabbi ever tell you something that's the opposite of what you think? Did your rabbi ever tell you, please don't donate any money? Did your rabbi ever tell you, please donate money? Did your rabbi tell you anything that's the opposite of whatever you believe? Meaning, are you getting counsel or are you getting slaps on the back, chazaku baruch, regardless of whether you drive on Shabbat or you've been driven on Shabbat? Whatever it is, is your rabbi really giving you counsel? But the second question is much more critical. The second question, Rabbutai Karim, is after your rabbi, assuming your rabbi gave you this counsel, did you listen? He gave you counsel. Did you listen to what he said? You went to your Rabbanit. Isha Kedosha, holy woman. Husband Tamit Chacham. She dedicates her life to Hashem. You went for guidance. She told you some things. Did you listen? Or you said, no, I think you're a little extreme, Rabbanit. Kvoda Rabbanit. I think you're a little extreme on this one. I don't think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to you on this one. I'm going to ask my husband what he thinks. I'm going to ask my wife what he thinks. I'm going to ask my other rabbanit, my other rabbi, my other this. So why'd you ask? People ask me questions all the time and then they don't listen. And I always wonder, do you have nothing else to do in your life other than to waste my time? Now if you want to waste your time, enjoy, enjoy wasting your time. You don't have that much time in the world. You want to waste it, enjoy. I don't know, it's kind of crazy to me. But why are you so vicious with other people's time. Why are you wasting other people's time? If you're going to ask somebody a question, you better be prepared to follow what they say. If not, don't ask. If you're not looking for some, if you're not looking to listen, ask Google. I'm serious. Ask Google. Ask the internet. Hashem had mercy on Tommy de Chachamim. He said, a bunch of you are not going to listen to you anyway, so at least hopefully they go to this Google, because Google is just a machine. At least they're not going to waste Google's time. If you're going to ask the Tamit Chacham that's learning Lashma, you're going to ask him questions, you're going to ask him for counsel, and he says X, and you believed it was Y. 
if you don't listen to him, you seriously have a very, very big problem. You have a very, very big problem in Shemayim. You don't have any emunat chachamim. You don't have any honor for the Torah. And you're not listening to it. You're not using the gift that Hashem gave you. You're mistreating the gift that Hashem gave you. And it's not a good idea. Why? Because Hashem eventually will stop giving you a gift that you disrespect. Emunat Shmuel says that these four qualities, this Eitza, Tushia, Binao, Gvura, this counsel, wisdom, understanding, and strength, is wisdom on how to fulfill the obligations to Hashem with Kavana. Understanding of how to penetrate into the depthness of each mitzvah. Not only serve Hashem with Kavana, but understand why we're doing it. Have the strength to overcome our spiritual foes, our Yetzirah. But ultimately, none of this will work unless you have the initial step, which is counsel, and that's counsel by this Talmud Chacham of how to avoid sinning. Because if you do a mitzvah every second, but you're continuing to sin and you don't do tshuva for your sins, it's not going to help you. It'll be good. You'll get, you'll get schar for your mitzvot. But if you continue violating Shabbat, if you continue going out with non-Jews, if you continue doing all the things that are considered sins in the eyes of Hashem, the mitzvot are not going to be enough to protect you. And that's why the Munat Shmuel says that ultimately it has to start with counsel to avoid sinning. But the depth of the mitzvot, the understanding of the mitzvot, the overcoming the weaknesses that we have, yes. But ultimately, you have to get counsel of how to avoid sinning. Now, the Mishnah continues and it says, "Venotenet lo malchut umemshala." That this holy Torah now is going to give you something that you can feel in this world, something that you can sense, something that you cannot miss. Actually, "Venotenet lo malchut umemshala." The Torah gives him kingship and dominion, and analytical knowledge. Analytical judgment. Chikudin. Now, obviously every single person that's learning Torah is not a king. He's not overruling any country. So what does it actually mean here? So, the Chachamim explain kingship is an air of royalty. A sense of feeling that someone that has Torah has, that no one else has. Someone that possesses the truth doesn't just have confidence. Confidence is somebody that believes he's right. But if you prove him wrong, the confidence dissipates. The confidence goes away. When someone has Torah, it's not just confidence. It's fulfillment. It's a certain state of being where nothing can change it. And dominion means that the Torah has given this person the power to influence his surroundings. To not only take this Torah that's going to give him good, a sense of good, a sense of fulfillment, but also his actions are going to have an impact on others. He's going to have the ability to influence other people. The Baalei Musar used to always say, Dvarim lalev, nichnasim lalev. Things that come out of the heart reach the heart. You can have somebody that has a lot of Torah, 
but he could speak to you and it's just everything that he says goes over your head you have no idea right you have no idea left you have no idea what he's saying you can't wait till it's over you want to go home you're hungry you're thirsty you're tired you're bored you can't wait but as somebody else doesn't know as much but he speaks and every word is like fire in your heart every word like there's a mental emotional spiritual earthquake happening in your life with every word why because you could tell your neshama can tell he believes what he's saying it's coming from his heart it's not just coming from some book it's not just coming from some idea that he heard and overheard somewhere it's a belief system it's a special siyata dishmaya it's a special assistance from heaven to reach people's hearts not everybody has it even if they have Torah there are plenty of people that I know that actually have an enormous amount of Torah but they do not have the ability to reach people some reach people in different ways some don't know how to reach people they don't know how to communicate at all and it's not because of speaking skills there's different ways of reaching people you don't always have to speak publicly but there's just certain people that just don't have it but people ask when you speak out there and you tell people the truth and the common question that you have is how do you do it told me that he uh, went to a uh, certain neighborhood in Israel and it was a group of American Jews that apparently knew who he was and know who I am and immediately attacked him with five with a barrage of questions oh how does uh, how does Rabbi Yaron say this and how does he say that and he can't say this and he can't say that and Baruch Hashem Rabbi Ephraim is if he doesn't have Ruach HaKodesh, he has all the tools for Ruach HaKodesh. He has something unbelievable. All the answers are fixed. like uh, They're all in sections, folders. It's unbelievable. It's like, wait, your question, answer. Question, answer. Question, answer. Question, answer. Page here, this here. He said, for three hours, three hours group, group attacking, one down, two, three, four down, five down, six down, ten down, twelve down. But they all had at the end, okay, fine. Everything that your own says is true. Fine. But how does he say it? He says, what do you mean, how does he say it? He's, his mouth moves and words come out. He goes, no, but like, we're religious our whole life. The truth came out at the end. He goes, we're religious our whole life. We're scared to say it. Like, we can't tell somebody, mot yumat, death penalty, this, that. How does he say it? Like, I, I, I can't say it like that. He goes, you should. He says, you should. That's what it says in the Torah. It's not his opinion. It says in the Torah. It's not his opinion. But people have this problem. Like, what do you mean? Maybe you shouldn't say it because you're not perfect, and he's not perfect, and no one's perfect. And they start throwing all types of things that are nonsensical and irrelevant. Like, in the last 24 hours, the few people that have attacked me publicly, if you were meritorious enough to see the, the beauty of their words and the machmaot, the compliments they have for me, you see that all they say is personal attacks. All it is is personal attacks. It has nothing to do with the facts. No one is saying no, but the halacha and Shulchan Aruch says the opposite. No, but the Rambam says the opposite. No, but the Mesilat Yesharim says the opposite. No one says that. No one says a single Torah source. Not a rabbi, not a nothing. What do they say? Who are you? You used to be on Wall Street, the filthiest business in the world. That's what one woman told me. The filthiest business in the world. Who are you to talk? First of all, why is Wall Street the filthiest business in the world? She called me, I answered her. I usually don't answer the phone, but Hashem wanted me to answer this person. 
And she started with this. She goes, you used to be on Wall Street, the filthiest business in the world. I said, wait, why is it the filthiest business in the world? She goes, you were there, you should know. I said, Wall Street is a place where there's money made, money law, I don't understand. I said, you use a phone to call me or? She goes, yeah. I said, so the company that made the phone, where do you think they got the money for? They found it on the street? They got it on Wall Street. You depend on Wall Street. All of you depend on Wall Street. The economy, the capitalism is Wall Street. What do you mean it's the filthiest business in the world? You have a phone? What do you think the company got the money for to, to build the phone? You have, a, you have the AT&T service? Where do you think AT&T gets the money to put the lines all over the air, all over the ground, all over everything? Where do you think it comes from? They find it in the air like man? Wall Street firms get it from investors and they build companies that way. What do you mean the filthiest business in the world? What does that have to do with anything anyway? She goes, no, but you know. I'm like, what? You know what? There's bad and good in everything. What do you think? There's a there's not a bunch of guys that have laundromats that don't go to uh, to to all types of places that are not not legal. What do you think that all the guys that work in a cab store, uh, the taxis, they're also all tzaddikim? Like, what do you mean? The ignorance of people always amazes me. Why? Because they have no facts, so they have to attack you as a person. Because if you, as a person, are bad, therefore everything else is bad. But the sad, sad reality is they attack you with nothing. It's like you have an atomic bomb and they throw a plastic fork at you. Shoo! Shoo! Like, what's the matter with you? Stop it. You look silly. One woman says, yeah, but you, you just started learning Torah. Rabbi Akib also just started learning Torah. Another person says, all types of wonderful things. You're mean, you're this, you're that. One person, ah, I'll keep this one to myself actually. <laughs> no, because I don't want to offend people. Okay, I know what you're talking about. That's the one I'm talking about, but don't mention it. Because if I mention and I publicize it, their punishment in Gainong gets bigger. And you don't want it. You don't want anyone to get punished. But the truth is, people do this to themselves. But then I had a somewhat of a communication with one person. And he sent me this rabbi's recording. He was like the eighth person that sent it to me. And I listened to it and I told him it's not, it doesn't have any sources. It's just his opinion. What I said has sources, not an opinion. But let's put all of that aside for a second. Let's think like regular people. Not like Moshe Rabbeinu. Not like Avraham Avinu. Let's just think like regular people. In a regular day, every day, what is the number one thing that people have an ambition for? Money. Number one thing that people have an ambition for is to make money. They wake up in the morning and everyone believes that today I'm going to be a millionaire. Every youngster thinks he's going to be a millionaire in six months. Every new idea is the next thing to slice bread. Every new this is the best thing. Everybody thinks that this is it. Today I'm going to get a raise. Today I'm going to get a promotion. Today I'm going to become the owner of the company. Today I'm going to get the job. Today everybody, everybody believes in today is the day. And they chase money. And they chase money in different ways. Some people gamble on Wall Street. Some people invest on Wall Street. Some people gamble in a casino. Some people just donate to the casino because they're bad gamblers to begin with. Point is that people do all types of silly things because of their money issues. Now, since everyone believes the saying that the money makes the world go round as if it's a ma'amal from the Torah, let's think about that for a second. If somebody that's in the position of a speaker that influences the public wants to gain money because that's his role, that's what he wants to do like everybody else, he's a normal person. 
that what is his number one thing that he was going to do? He's going to try to be the most popular person in the world. How do you become the most popular person in the world? You tell people that they're great, that they're wonderful, and you give them compliments until there's no end. And you tell them that everything that they do is a mitzvah. Oh, you, you go with men with men? Okay, mitzvah. Oh, it's Michal Shabbat? No, it's alive and alive, not Mot Yumas. The opposite, we change this. That. You start changing things to, right, to, to soothe people. Reality is, if you want to be popular, you're going to tell people what they want to hear. If you do the opposite, it doesn't make you more popular. It makes you less popular. In fact, it makes you hated by some. Some people will spend their time and resources just to exercise their hate against you. Try to ruin shirim. Try to make videos against you, flyers, and so on and so forth. Which means that saying the truth is not necessarily an economical <coughs> plan. It's not a viable business plan. Why? You're not going to get as many donations if you tell people that they have to do tshuva. So why on earth would you do it? If not for the emit. If not for the real reason that that's what's supposed to be done. But that's what people don't think about. People just simply don't think like this. They just think, no, no, you're saying something different than my rabbi. You're just saying something different than my reality. You're just saying something different than what I thought. So therefore, you, you must be wrong. You're, you're Amalek, you're Haman, you're, you're Nebuchadnezzar, you're Nazi, you're uh, uh, Gaddafi. You have a source why I'm Gaddafi? You have a source why I'm Nazi? You have a source for any of this stuff or just your opinion? You have a source for why you're right? Forget about why I'm wrong. I'm wrong because you're saying I'm wrong. Okay, so you will use you as the source. What gives you the source that you're right? Is there a source for that or is it just your opinion? And that's Rabotai. One of the most important things that when you stick to the Torah, and eliminate your own opinion, it's going to give you the ultimate gift, which is being analytical in judgment. You're going to be able to assess every situation for what it is, even if it ruins your reality, even if it bends your reality, even if it hurts you. You're still going to be able to do it. Why? Because the emet is above everything emet is above everything no emet nothing's worth it nothing's valid if you cannot hear a rebuke that tells you you have to change you haven't begun to do tshuva if you don't listen to the person that's telling you the truth Simply because you're looking for maybe there's something else. Maybe this, maybe that. You haven't begun to do tshuva. Because once a person gets the gift from Hashem of Siat Dishmaya, he's going to give you the truth. In essence, Hashem is giving you the truth through this person. He's not going to continue giving you this truth over and over again for eternity. Once, twice, ten times, twenty times, fifty times, a hundred times, but eventually you don't listen. You lose you lose the gift. We'll finish with a couple of stories to give you guys a little bit of an understanding. I've told you guys a story about the Chazonish. Chazonish is yard site, I believe, it was last week. He spends his entire life. Four walls, Sifre Torah. No one understood how he knows so much about the human body. But yet, people, doctors, experts, called him on a regular basis to ask him critical questions of how to perform life-saving surgeries. 
There was one time a boy that went a underwent a heart surgery, but the surgery had a little bit of a complication, and the boy didn't wake up. He was in a coma, and the doctor said, if he doesn't wake up within 24 hours, he's never going to wake up. The parents called the Chazonish, explained to him the situation. The Chazonish says, tell the doctor, he's right that it's dangerous that the boy didn't wake up, but he's not right about the time. If he wakes up before 72 hours, it's fine. And that's exactly what happened. The boy woke up after 24 hours and was perfectly fine. So the doctor was amazed at how everything worked out exactly how the Chazuni said. And he, and he called and he asked him, how, how did you know that, the, the, like, where did you get this from? Because, oh, of course I knew. This is in the Mishnah. This is in the Mishnah of Oalot. To this day, Almost a hundred years have passed. No one understands what he means. How did you get this information that it's this boy, as long as he wakes up within 25, 20, 72 hours, from this Mishnah in Oalot? What does one thing have to do with the other? Dr. Hardin Ashkenazi says that there was one time a complication in a major surgery and they didn't know how to proceed. The family called the Chazonish. Chazonish asked the family to give Dr. Hardin this, two, this question. Which one of these complications do you have? A, such and such. B, such and such. If it's A, do this. If it's B, do this. Dr. Hardin looked at this. He says, who's, the, who's this genius? Who's this medical genius? He goes, oh, it's a rabbi. He shows this note to the rest of those world-class surgeons. He says, look, he just summarized what any of us would take hundreds of pages to write in two sentences. When a person uses the Torah as a blueprint of creation, like the Zohar in Parsha Truma says, then literally he can use the Torah to manipulate nature. He becomes nature. Later this week on Thursday, Bezat Hashem, we're going to have a shiur in uh, Hollywood about the supernatural, the mystical, the things that people like to talk about, how, who, what, when, what's real, what's fake, where are the sources for it in the Torah. But one of the things you're going to hear is that how the Torah and those that stick to it, they don't consider themselves supernatural. They don't consider anything supernatural. Once a person is good to Torah, everything becomes natural. Rabbi Wasim and Allah Shalom said that there's five conditions that are necessary for a person that's going to give advice. First one is he must be intelligent. He must know what he's talking about. Two, he must have a limited or no vested interest in the issue. You cannot ask your rabbi about a business deal you're doing with him. You have to ask somebody else. You cannot ask a rabbi about money that he is involved in. A marriage he's involved in, and so on and so forth. Which means that if the rabbi is your friend, you can't ask him for advice anymore. Because he has a bias, even if the bias is feelings. Three, he has to have a general sense of fairness. Without which he cannot... A person cannot think clearly, meaning that if a person cannot see straight, right or left, cannot see things for as they are, 
they're not suitable to give advice. If they always try to manipulate the truth in order to soothe your feelings and, 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 and behaviors and so on, and they don't want to tell you something because they don't want to get you mad, and they don't want to tell you something because they don't want you to be offended, and they don't want to tell you something because of this and that, they're not a place of advice. For the mindset totally and exclusively shaped by the Torah. If your rabbi is more businessman than he is rabbi, then he should stick to business. Chachamim said that as soon as rabbi started getting the title of doctor and put it before the title of rabbi, he started realizing that the rabbi is sick and he needs the doctor's help. You see a lot today, doctor, rabbi, such and such. Which means that they value the doctor much more than the rabbi title. And what the Chachamim was saying is that this way of showing them their titles, Dr. Rabbi, is telling you that the rabbi is sick. He needs a doctor. And last but not least, this person that's going to give you advice must have siyat dishmaya, Must have divine assistance in order to give you advice. Without divine assistance, he's not going to have anything. And how do we get this divine assistance? How do we get to have this special help from heaven. In last week's parashat Vayera, it says that Avraham Avinu got to the place where again they took his wife. They took Sarai Menu, and Hashem came to Avimelech, he told him, I'm going to kill you if you don't let her go. You better ask for forgiveness. You better ask this Avram to pray for you because he's a prophet. So Avimelech came to Avram. He told him, why'd you do this to me? Why'd you do this to my people? What do we do to you that you didn't tell us that Sarah is your sister, is your, is your wife? Why'd you tell us she's your sister? So Avram says, Vayomer Avimelech el Avram, ma ra'ita ki asita et adavar hazeh. Vayomer Avram, ki amarti rak en yirat Elohim b'makom hazeh, v'areguni. Avimelech says to Avram in Pasuk 20, in uh, chapter 20, verse 10, and Avimelech said to Avram, What did you see that you did such a thing? Meaning, why didn't you tell us the truth? Why did you tell us that uh, Sarai Menu is uh, your sister instead of telling us she's your wife? And Avram says, Because I said that there is no fear of God in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Avraham Avinu teaches us something that the Gemara says is the foundation of all foundations. Yerat Hashem Iotzaro. The fear of Hashem, that's his treasure. To such an extent that the Gemara says if the person that you're with, he could be your rabbi or your best friend. He doesn't have Yirat Shemaim, you're not allowed to be in a closed room with him. Why? He may kill you. What do you mean he may kill me? He's a rabbi. Where do we learn this from? Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu told Avimelech, why didn't I tell you? I saw there's no Yirat Shemaim here. If there's no Yirat Shemaim, you may kill me. What, we're murderers? What, 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 what do you mean? How, what, what, we walk around with knives, with guns, with what? He goes, if you don't have Yirat Shemaim, that means you believe you're God. And if you believe you're a God, all bets are off of what you can do. All bets are off of what, what's there. So this Rabotai is critical information for all of us to know in order to get the truth, how to get it, what to get, who, what, when, and how. It's important because today we're, there's an infestation. There's a plague of falsehood even coming from people that look like they have Yirat Shamaim look like they know Torah, look like a lot of things. You have to look at things a little deeper because unfortunately today, it's very, very sad that people are more f afraid of, of money than they are afraid of God. And that's why they're distorting the truth as much as they are in the last few days and pretty much every day before that. We'll continue the rest of the Mishnah tomorrow. 
But I'll uh, leave the rest for questions. Yes. Can the Chachamim say that if a person knew the value of his suffering in this world, he would actually pray to have suffering. And the reason why is because anytime you have a suffering in this world, it could be considered part of your kaparat avonot. Kaparat avonot meaning is that it's a replacement, like a sacrifice, for any sin you've already made. And instead of suffering in Genom, you're suffering here. But since it's here, the value of the suffering here is exponentially more valuable here than over there. Meaning that if you suffer here for one minute, it could be the equivalent of one year in Genom. So if a person, let's say for example, loses a bunch of money, that could literally mean that he just, they took off 100 or 200 or 300 years off of his Genom statement because of all the bad things that he did. So the Chachamim say that everything that's some form of suffering is a kaparat avonot. Obviously some more, some less. If somebody went into their pocket and was looking to get a dime, but instead they took out a quarter, it is a little bit of suffering. Even though it's minuscule baby suffering that you have to go into your pocket again to get the right coin, it's still considered suffering. And therefore, in Shamaim they say, oh, Okay, let's erase an hour off of his genome statement. This is to show us how Hashem is trying to constantly give us more merits. How Hashem is trying to constantly find ways not to punish us in a punishment place that no one ever wants to hear about, see, talk about, listen, or anything. But the reality is, is that it's real. It's a real place. It's not embarrassing you. It's not making fun of you. It's fire. So we should do everything we can to avoid going there. One, by fulfilling our time with mitzvot. Two, by fulfilling the Torah for the sake of fulfilling the Torah. Three, stop sinning. And four, if suffering actually does happen, know that there is a benefit to the suffering. There is a very big benefit to the suffering. And if you accept the suffering with love, then the value of your suffering is exponentially higher than if you accept them, but you're still bitter. Yes and no. I mean, it's not so simple, meaning that if a person, like Allah says, a person that, goes, that uh, has a bad wife doesn't see the gate of Genom. Now, this is not necessarily a literal statement. But in essence, what the Gemara is telling you is that having a bad wife is like having Genom all the time. So it's Kaparat Avonot every day. But if a person fulfilled the entire Torah while having a uh, bad wife, then yes, they won't see Genom. Why? Because any sins they did make, she's a Kaparat Avonot every day. She's suffering every day, so he'll be erased every day. But if he doesn't fulfill the Torah, if he's a Mechal Shabbat, if he's a homosexual on the side, if he steals, if he does all these other things, doesn't matter how bad his wife is, it's not going to help him. It's not going to help him. But you have to feel bad for people that have bad wives because I actually have a situation right now with somebody that I know is, uh, unfortunately, he has a really, really horrible wife. He has a really, really horrible wife that even on my enemies, I don't wish him to wish him to have such a wife, but she calls herself religious. She calls herself religious, and she is uh, unfortunately a very, very bad person. And uh, but there's not there's nothing to help. There's, there's, it's, 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 a, it's a moot point. There's just there's nothing to do there. It's a hopeless situation. And even though what she does is very, very bad, not only for him but for other people, it's you have to like limit the uh, how upset you get out of it, because he can't do anything for himself. He can't help you. You feel bad for the guy. But the same token, yeah, there's some people have these, there's some people that are just bad people. Yeah, there's plenty of them, unfortunately. Next. Uh, if a person's not afraid of anything, does that make them holy? Or if a person's holy, he's not afraid of anything? What does it mean, anything? He's not afraid of God? No, he's afraid of God, but he's not afraid of, like, men, or he's not afraid of, like, money, like you're saying. 
It depends why he's not afraid. If he's not afraid because he knows that everything comes from Hashem, then he's on a very high level of emunah and bitachon. But if he's not afraid because he doesn't care, then he's simply crazy. The, 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 line, the line between you know, real emunah and, 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 and craziness is not very thick. It's a very thin line. And the thing is, though, is that there's a lot of people that believe they have emunah, but they're simply crazy. Or they have emunah, but in reality, it's convenient emunah. They have emunah that everything is okay because everything's okay. They have no problems with money because they have no problems with money. You know, so it's, it, it all depends on what the, the root issue. The way that a person can understand where they stand is how they act under pressure. Koso kiso bekaso. Mara says, how do you get to know a person? First, you, you see how a person reacts after he has a few glasses of wine. Koso. Second, you see how he reacts how he, uh, uh, when there's money problems. Kiso, his pocket. His pocket gets affected. He just lost a bunch of money. He just made a lot of money. Or something happened with money. Kaso. Kaso is his anger. Somebody made him angry. Somebody told him something. And it's, it's one of his pet peeves. It's one of his things that gets him to lose his mind. Somebody insulted his wife. Somebody insulted her husband. Somebody did something to their kids. How do they act then? Those three things, generally speaking, are when you get to know who the person really is. Everything else is superficial. Someone can say they have emunah, but the Zohar Kadosh talks about, and the uh, Chazonish I've mentioned to you guys talks about, and the whole Torah talks about how people have fake emunah. You know, but it's, the reality is that emunah is something that you're only going to find out if you have it once it's under pressure. Can? You need the person constantly check to see if what he thinks that he has is that what it actually is. Like he may think he has emuna, yeah. but it should only be checking inside to see maybe it's just you don't have this much. The Rabbi Israel Misalant constantly tested his emuna, constantly tested his emuna and bitachon and Hashem in order for it to get to what it was. One time, there was a debate between him and his students. Now, his students, Baruch Hashem, each one of them was an angel. And he explained to them that you're supposed to get to a level of bitachon in Hashem, confidence in Hashem, that anything is possible. There's no limitations. And they said, no, no, we think that's too much. He says, no, it's not too much. And they went back and forth. And there was a lot of fire in the, in the Bet Midrash. And eventually he said, I have so much bitachon in Hashem. I have so much confidence in Hashem that I believe I'm going to get a gold watch today. Now in those days, getting a gold watch was like you're a millionaire. I said, ah, for the Rav. No, there's no, no reason. As they were thinking, they were trying to finish this sentence. No, come on, you're Magzim, you're, you're exaggerating. All of a sudden, a bunch of Russian soldiers came into the Bet Midrash, scary Amalek, comes to the Bet Midrash, and we're like, oh, machok it over. Well, let's go back to the, well, everybody's afraid. What's going on? Why are Russians here? And they say, who is the biggest Talmud Chacham here? Everybody points to the Rosh Bet Midrash, Rabbi Sami Salan, Dolado, him. He's the head. Say, sir, they take out of their pocket a little box. This is for you. He opens it in front of everybody. What is it? A gold watch. And now everybody asks, wait a minute, what is this? Plan? Who is this? What is this? What is this? What, like, what the rabbi says, the rabbi Sahim is on and says, I, I don't know who is this. Well, they asked him, the Russians, where would you get this from? Why are you coming here? Because he goes, my buddy in the war, he was Jewish. And uh, he got shot, but before he died, he told me, please go to the yeshiva and give it to the biggest Talmud Chacham. And to honor my boy, honor my friend, that's what I'm doing. So, now, what, Rabbi Saimi Salant just got lucky? Only Kofir thinks that. 
reality is, Rabotai, is that in order for a person to get to a high level of emunah, he has to exercise that muscle. Just like if a person wants to have very big biceps, very big triceps, very big other types of muscles in the body, he must exercise those muscles. He must push himself more and more and more and make bigger and bigger commitments. Now, did anybody ever ask themselves the question that we're going to go over in a couple of weeks? After Yosef at Sadiq was uncovered that he's still alive, the brothers came back to Yaakov and they told Yaakov, Od Sadiq, Od, Od Yosef Chai. Yosef is still alive and he's the viceroy of, uh, of Egypt. So everything was fine back then. And then Yaakov sends Yehuda to go to Egypt first. Just like he did before this whole thing happened where he sent Benjamin with Yehuda. Why is this strange? Because Yehuda wasn't the firstborn. It was Reuven. And when Reuven came to Yaakov, he told him, listen, Abba, if I don't bring Benjamin back, kill my kids. Kill my kids. Yaakov didn't listen to him. He goes, go away. Go away, Reuven. Go away. One son's going to die. I'm going to kill two more grandsons. Go away. He, didn't, he rebuked him. But Yehuda came to Yaakov. He says, Abba, I'm not coming back without Benjamin. Yaakov says, go, take him. Just like he told Yehuda, go to Egypt, build a Bet Midrash over there, and then I'll come. Why didn't he tell Uven to do all this? Because Rabotai Yekarim, Yehuda showed something that all of us need, which is that he's willing to make commitments. He's willing to make, com make commitments that exercise his emunah muscle, that do not make any sense whatsoever. He's willing to make very big commitments to show he believes in Hashem. Not just say in words he believes in Hashem, but to show he believes in Hashem. And Yaakov says, you're willing to put everything on the line. You're not coming back without Benjamin. You're a man, you're, that's a commitment. But to tell me something like, oh, I'll kill my other sons, that's not a commitment. That's somebody crazy. I don't need to deal with crazy people. I have enough already, Yaakov said. But you're willing to make commitment to show your faith, to show your emunah. You got it. Go, take my son. Take my son. So to exercise our emunah muscles, to get to emunah, Rabotai, the secret is, is that you have to make large commitments. Now, don't start making, buying houses that you can't afford tomorrow. Exercise your emunah muscles from where you're at. If you haven't exercised your muscles yet until this day, then start small. Pass the test, do a bigger one. Pass the test, do a bigger one. How do you know if you pass the test? When you make an, em when you make an emunah test, you're making a commitment, and the way you know if you pass the test is if you're not worried. But if you're worried the whole time until it works out, you fail the test. Whether it works out or doesn't work out, you fail the test miserably. But if you continue to learn Torah, you continue to fulfill mitzvot. You continue to believe in Hashem. You continue to say, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. It's going to work out. You're not worried. You're not losing sleep over it. You pass the test. If you, When it got to you, when the salvation arrived, you're not even surprised. Like, oh yeah, Bok Hashem. Tabach Shemo, you have Sudat Udaya to publicize to everybody else that Hashem is the king of the world. Not because you're surprised he's the king of the world and then he's able to do anything, but because you want to publicize it for, for, for the sake of King Hashem. That's how you have emunah test. You make large commitments over time or bigger commitments over time. And that's how you know where, where you stand. So a person that has a, uh, 
emuna and he doesn't know where he stands, then he has to start making commitments. He has to make large commitments. It doesn't necessarily always have to be money. It could be other things. He can make commitment about learn, finishing a masechet. He says, okay, I'm going to finish a masechet this month. Even though in his entire life he's never finished a masechet in a gemara in one month, or two months, or even a year. But he said, I'm going to finish it. How? I don't know. I'm going to work every single day. I'm going to do everything I need to do. To learn every day a few hours, to dedicate a few hours every day, to do everything I can. And Bezad Hashem, Hashem will give me the siyat dishmaya to finish the Masechet this month. Finish the Masechet this quarter. Finish the Masechet before the holiday. Whatever it is. So when a person makes these commitments that are spiritual commitments, to finish more Torah, to complete more, to learn more, to do more tzedakah, things like that, then he gets a special help from heaven. But if a person is constantly making, you know, these commitments just because he wants to satisfy his pocket, then that's not, that's not emunah. That's just desire and you're testing Hashem for no reason. Like saying, oh no, no, I'm going to buy this house and Hashem's going to give me the money. Even if he gives you the money, it doesn't mean you have emunah. Oh, I'm going to start this business and Hashem's going to make it work. Even if the business works initially, it doesn't mean you have emunah. And Munah typically has to do with spiritual things, of course, also material things, but you have to connect it too. So, for example, a person that makes a certain amount of money, the best Munah test that a person can have, I got you, I'm going to answer your question eventually, don't worry. Uh, the best Munah test that a person can do is to, what is mitzvah of ma'asel. And the reason why is because most of us live in this world where we're all overspenders, we all spend more than what we what we make. And maser is almost impossible for most people to give. But the reality is that when they ask Rav Avadia, what are you supposed to give as far as maser? They're supposed to give 10% of the gross. You make $5,000 a month, you're supposed to give $500. He goes, yeah, but what if I have bills of $5,000 a month? If I give the $500 a month in Maasel, then I'm, I'm going to be negative every month. He says, that's Emunah. That's Emunah. It doesn't make any sense. Exactly. Emunah is not supposed to make sense. Now, if you have serious Emunah and you've been giving Maasel for a while, then it's time to upgrade. Then it's supposed to be the full Maasel, which is Maasel Vetitashe, which is called Chamishid. It's 20%. You're supposed to give 20%. But that's assuming you make normal income. But if you make high income, or you have a lot of money that you don't need, you can give 100% of your money. But the point is, Abutai, is that the, uh, the test of Maasel is one of the best emunah tests out there because most people try to rationalize and log you know, use their logic of how certain things are going to work, and they look at Maasel like a bill. And as soon as they can't afford something, the first thing they cut is masel. First thing they cut is taka. First thing. They won't cut the phone that they don't need. They won't cut the second line they need. They don't want uh, to get rid of the car. They don't want to downgrade on the house. They don't want to downgrade on this, on spending, on dinners, or nothing. What do they do? They cut toa first. Just like somebody was uh, in a ship, the, the, uh, the guy, uh, the captain of the ship said, Listen, we're, we're, uh, we're drowning. People have to start taking stuff off. Guy starts taking his tefillin and talit, throws it out. As you would have it, the storm settled. He gets to the coast. And the rabbi is like, okay, so let's go pray. He goes, no, I'm sorry, rabbi, I don't have my talit and tefillin. He goes, what do you mean you talit and tefillin? He goes, oh, we're shaking and this and that. He goes, yeah, why don't you throw your clothes, your luggage, your TV, your computer, your house. Your, your, why, don't you throw, why is the first thing you're throwing away your tefillin and talit? That's because you never want to do it in the first place. Because you didn't want to do it in the first place. So a munah test is something that uh, you're going to put up pressure. Put pressure on yourself intentionally. One way or another, you're going to have pressure on you. It's better than it's from you than it's just coming by itself naturally. Yes? Why are you testing Hashem? If I'm test, if I make a commitment to, for example, that I'm going to give $500 a month 
to a Talmit Chacham in, uh, in, uh, in Israel. How is that testing? Why is that testing Hashem and not testing myself? The fact that the salvation is going to come from Hashem, of course. And Emunah is Emunah in Hashem, of course. But the test is for me to believe that Hashem is the only way I'm going to get salvation, not that Hashem works for me. It's that Hashem is going to give me salvation, but Hashem is going to only bring me salvation if the whole time that I made the commitment and the whole time where it doesn't make any sense, the whole time I don't know where it's going to come from, I'm not having any doubts. I know that salvation doesn't come from Hashem. So Emunah is not Emunah test is not testing Hashem and doubting Him Chas Shalom. It's the doubt is within us. That the issue is with us that we don't believe in Hashem enough that He's the source of all salvation. That we think that we need to help Hashem, and that's the problem with most people. Most people think that they need to help Hashem. They need to help Hashem with money. They need to help Hashem with all of the things, which is the reason why people spend more time than they need to uh, working more time than they need to uh, chasing money, more time than they need to doing a lot of things. Instead of spending it serving Hashem, they're, they're trying to, in essence, you know, serve uh, men in order to get material benefits. So when you have Emunah in Hashem, you're spending more time serving Him, which means, let's say, for example, if you are, uh, made a commitment to, make, uh, to give more donations, but that, that means that you're not going to work harder in order to make more money. That means you're going to work the same and spend the same amount of time learning Torah, but still expect more money to come in. How? That's Hashem's issue. So you're not testing Hashem. You're testing yourself. Hashem can do it. Whether Hashem, whether Hashem gives it to you or not doesn't change Hashem's status. It only change You change. You're the only one that changes. Whether you believe that salvation will come from Him or you believe that it can only come from you through common sense things that you would do. So as far as Emunah... And Muna is something that uh, you can only get through uh, a continuous series of tests. You know, because it's natural in Muna, everybody has to some extent. For example, if somebody uh, comes to me and says, listen, let me $5. Right on the spot, I wouldn't even ask them what their name are. I'll lend them 5 bucks. Why? I have a Muna, they're going to return it back. What if the same person says, let me 1000 bucks? I say, well, do you have any references? Where are you? you don't know who I am? No, I don't know who you are. You are. I don't know who you are. No, I don't know. Well, I, I, okay, give me references. Let me ask somebody else if they agree with who you are. Why? I'm going to lend you a thousand bucks. I want to know who I'm going to lend a thousand bucks because why? My emuna is limited in you. It's limited to five dollars. Once we cross five bucks, then I have to ask for some more references. So that's the test. We have emuna in ourselves. We have emuna in ourselves. We have emuna in things that make sense to us. We're going to make financial commitments based on how much we know for sure we have in the bank. So I'm going to give 100 bucks a month in staka because I know that I make X amount of money every month. So $100 for sure I could afford and I'm going to do that. That means that it's good, but it's not an emunah test. It's not an emunah test. Why? Because you know that logically it all works like a phone bill. You know how much you can afford, which plan you can buy. You know the car bill. You know which one you can buy, which you can afford. So there's no test there. And we're not test, meaning that you're putting things that are above and beyond what would naturally happen, the natural occurrence of events. And this is something that a person should do on a regular basis to themselves in order to get the high level of Muna. But again, be very, very careful with how you judge yourself. Don't judge yourself like you're Moshe Rabbeinu on day one. Because if you do, you'll end up being homeless. You have to judge yourself accordingly to where you stand. You have to know where you stand. If you're, you know, you're still beginning, start with small tests. See how you pass them. See how you react under pressure. See if you get a panic attack. See if you're stressed out. See if you're not able to learn anymore. You know, some people want to do the thing where they want to fast. I talked to you guys about this last week. If you can fast in order to atone for your sins and learn Torah the whole day, you should do it. But if your fasting is like my fasting, where when I fast, I can't move, I'm like, corpse, then don't fast. Don't do anybody any favors. Don't do anybody any favors. Why? Because your fasting is meaningless. All you're doing is a diet. When the tzaddikim were fasting, they weren't sleeping all day. They were learning Torah all day. So if you're learning Torah all day and fasting, then your fast is worth something. But if your fasting is uh, just uh, you sleeping all day, then it's just a diet. So everybody should know where they stand. You should know where you stand, how you function under the pressure. And that's how you're going to get to know yourself. 
You're going to get to know yourself under pressure. No pressure, you're not going to get to know yourself. Next question. Yes. Um, I, I understand it's forbidden to test Hashem, but is it from Maser he allows you to test him? Yes. Maser with Yudash, that's the only thing that Hashem says to test him. He says that anyone that gives Maser, some say that the Maser is 10%, some say it's 20%, but he says that you will be guaranteed wealth in your lifetime if you continuously give Maser. Now I can tell you from experience that if this blessing will come true, for you as far as the Maser, you're going to become wealthy, I can guarantee you will have plenty of really big tests on the way. Guarantee, I'm telling you from experience. Guarantee that if Hashem, before Hashem gives you the blessing of having financial comfort, because you're giving Maser, you're going to have a bunch of financial discomfort. You're going to have a bunch of excuses of why you shouldn't give Maser. You're going to have a bunch of reasons of why you can't give Maser. But to pass the test, you have to continue doing it. So before Hashem gives you the glory, the, the, the big prize... There are tests on the way. The bigger the prize, the bigger the test. Just like we talked about in the last Mishnah in uh, chapter 5 of Pekei Avot, where the, the schar, the, the reward is based on the effort. So, yes, you are supposed to test Hashem, but you should know that while you're testing Hashem, in reality, He's testing you too. He doesn't need the test. He passed it. He's God. It's really you that changes. Next. Tomorrow night, Bezal Hashem, we're going to continue with this Mishnah. Hopefully, Bezal Hashem will complete it tomorrow. Bezal Hashem. Um, and then, uh, again, don't forget, we have a shiur on Thursday night. It's in Hollywood. Uh, just look on the uh, website, bezalthashem.org, for the information, or the WhatsApp groups, or the Facebook groups, or the Facebook page, uh, to uh, know the addresses of the, the shield tomorrow and Thursday. Because both of them, if you're going to attend, you have to RSVP because they're in uh, private communities that require, have a, you know, people at the gates. If you don't RSVP, they're not going to let you in. So don't RSVP too late. Do it as soon as possible if you're going to attend. And Bezal Hashem, they'll let you in. Again, it happens a few times already. People didn't RSVP. They showed up. They didn't let them in at the gate. And they got mad at me like I'm the gate. Don't get mad at me. I'm not the gate. I'm telling you now. You want to come? RSVP. It's not that difficult. All you got to do is write an email to the person that's on the flyer. If there's an email there, you write an email to them. I'm coming. My name is blah, blah. I am coming by myself. I'm coming with two people. I'm coming this, that, that. That's it. They'll put you on the list. And that's it. You'll be able to come. Learn with us. Bezal Hashem. It'll be very, very interesting. Shield tomorrow. And another interesting show with Hashem on Thursday. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.